Hello, I'm Sensei Alex Kakyo. Thanks for joining me for Meditation and Sutra Study. This evening's practice will consist of a 15-minute guided meditation, a reading from a Buddhist scripture, followed by a Dharma talk. The title of today's talk will be Emptiness and a Buddhist Thanksgiving. Before we get into that, please subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you'll be notified when I post talks in the future. If you wouldn't mind hitting the like button, that'd be great too. So we'll start today like we always do on Wednesdays with our guided meditation. I'll give you a moment to get into position. The only rules are you need to be in a position that's comfortable and that you can hold for at least 15 minutes without moving. If you want to lay down, that's perfectly acceptable, but please don't fall asleep. If you like some instruction, what I like to do is sit down cross-legged either on the floor or on a cushion. Back straight, chin slightly tucked. Left hand goes palm up in the lap. Right hand goes palm up over the left in what we call the concentration mudra in Buddhism. Eyes can be closed, or if you'd like to keep them open, simply point them down at the floor at a 45 degree angle. That way we can eliminate visual distractions. And you start very simply by breathing in and out through the nose. Breathing in this way engages the parasympathetic portion of our nervous system, it tells our body that we're safe. It's okay to relax for a while. This type of breathing can also be done in our day to day activities if we're feeling stressed and we need to find a way to center ourselves. On every inhale, we extend our belly button slightly, like we had a large meal. And on every exhale, we relax. If we're wondering what to do with our thoughts, we simply bring our attention to the physical sensation of our breathing. A feeling of air moving in and out of our lungs. The feeling of our diaphragm expanding and contracting. The feeling of our clothing against our skin. We'll breathe in this way for about a minute, and I'll keep time. And if our mind wanders, that's okay. We say hello to our thoughts. We bring our focus back to our breathing.
wonderful. Keep breathing. Now we visualize a fire burning in our belly and the space behind our belly button. This fire is our favorite color. If we like blue, the fire is blue. If we like red, the fire is red. With every inhale, we visualize ourselves breathing in air through our nostrils. With every exhale, we visualize ourselves blowing on the base of the fire, feeding it oxygen, making it bigger and brighter with every breath. This fire represents our own enlightened nature. We're going to use our breath to feed our enlightenment for a while. We breathe in, air comes into our lungs. We breathe out, we blow on the fire of our enlightenment, amplifying it. We'll breathe in this way for two minutes. I'll keep time. Wonderful. Everyone's sitting so quietly, so still. It's very encouraging. Now we'll visualize a channel of energy going down from the fire in our belly all the way to the center of the earth. And once we get there, we find an energy that's identical to our own. If our fire is green, the Earth's fire is green. If our fire is orange, the Earth's energy is orange. And very gently, we'll start pulling the Earth's energy into ourself, blinding it with the spiritual power in our belly.
2,600 years ago, the Buddha realized on the earth to realize enlightenment. And now we'll do the same. With every inhale, we visualize energy coming up from the earth, resting it in our belly. With every exhale, we continue to blow on that energy, making it bigger and brighter with every breath. We breathe in, extending our belly button, pulling energy into ourself, blending it with the energy in our belly. And with every exhale, we blow on that energy, feeding it oxygen, amplifying it. We'll breathe in this way for about two minutes. And if our minds wander, that's okay. We simply say hello to our thoughts and bring our focus back to our breathing and the visualization. Good work. Now we'll send a second channel of energy up from our belly all the way up to the top of our head. So we have that fire in the space behind our belly button. We have a channel of energy going down to the center of the earth. And we have another channel going from that same fire up to the top of our head. And very gently, with every inhale, we visualize ourselves bringing energy up from the earth, storing it in our belly. With every exhale, we visualize that energy exploding up through the channel till it hits the tops of our heads and coming out like a volcano. We breathe in, energy comes up from the earth, reaching our belly. We breathe out, that same energy goes up, out the top of our heads, exploding like a volcano, showering every inch of us in healing spiritual light. You've had a challenging week. We have a holiday tomorrow with all that that entails. 
This is our chance to send healing whenever it's needed in our body. We'll breathe in this way for about a minute. And I'll keep time. Wonderful. We've had a very powerful practice this evening. Now it's time to gently bring it to a close. We begin by closing off the channel of energy to the top of our head. Slowly pushing the energy down until it stops right there at our belly. Then we close off the channel of energy going from our belly to the earth. As we do so, maybe we give a silent bow, thanking the earth for helping us in our practice. Now we focus for a moment on that fire in our belly, the spiritual enlightenment that we all possess. We remind ourselves that we can call on this fire whenever we need to. Anytime we're stressed or overburdened during the week, it's there. But for now, we allow the visualization to fade. We come back into our bodies by moving our heads to the left and then to the right. Slowly alternating, gently back and forth. Feeling the physical sensations in our bones, in our neck. Then we come back to center. We roll our shoulders forward. And back. Slowly and gently. Alternating. Finally, we let them hang gently towards the floor. Now, if our eyes are closed, when we're ready, we open them. I'll give you about 30 seconds to do that. Thanks for doing that with me. <sighs> Meditation is so beautiful, so important to our practice. Even better when we can do that as a group. Now we'll move into the suture reading for this evening. 
Our reading will come from the Center Within, the Reverend Guillaume M. Kubose. Not necessary to have a copy of the text, but it can be useful if you'd like to follow along. And tonight's reading will come from page 76. The essay is called Forget Yourself. Dogen, a famous Buddhist teacher of 13th century Japan, said, To know Buddhism is to know oneself. To know oneself is to forget oneself. To forget oneself is an interesting statement. To forget oneself does not mean to become dumbfounded. On the contrary, it is when you are doing something so intensely that you forget yourself. Doer and doing become totally one. No ego self exists. There is no self-consciousness. The ego, the pretending self, disappears. One transcends oneself. This kind of state is to forget oneself. The forget in Dogen's forget oneself has nothing to do with memory. It's not the same thing as leaving the house and forgetting your keys. It is not a lack of consciousness either. Some time ago in a cartoon, a father was depicted lying on the couch, a newspaper over his face. The mother instructed the son to call his father for dinner. The son, seeing his father under the newspaper fast asleep, came back to the mother and reported, Oh, daddy is in Nirvana. The father had forgotten himself, but this is not the enlightened forgetting oneself of Buddhism. The Buddhist forgotten self is a dynamic self. If we live life in this dynamic forgotten state, life becomes creative. The teaching of forget the self or selflessness can also be expressed by the term suchness, things as they are are in a state of suchness. When the sun comes out, a flower opens up and blooms. This is how we should live, with no ego, just being. This is forgetting oneself. It is putting your whole life into whatever you do. To say, put your whole life into it, or do it with life, does not mean being tense or straining at what you do. To be totally involved in something is quite natural. You are relaxed and yet totally aware. In such a state, there is no this or that thinking. If you are thinking of something else while performing the Japanese tea ceremony, you always make a mistake. The same thing happens in chanting. Even though the verses are memorized, if some thought comes into your mind, then you make a mistake. Doing something is a wonderful thing. You can put yourself into it and forget yourself. If your mind is trained, whatever you do can be done with a single-mindedness. You are able to create a one-pointedness of the mind. When you do something, you are able to do it completely. When you go to bed, you are able to sleep completely. Stillness of the body is not resting. Mind totally forgotten. That is rest. You can be at rest while busy doing something. Buddhism is learning how to live by forgetting oneself. It is characteristic in Buddhism to use negative expressions such as forget oneself, selflessness, or non-self. I think this is better than a positive way of expressing things. But positive expression is used, it limits itself. If we say concentrate, then we try so hard to concentrate and the self is in it. You cannot think I have to forget and expect to forget. You cannot achieve the forgotten state by trying to forget oneself. This is a dualistic way of thinking. It implies that there is a self to be forgotten there is a self which does the forgetting. Instead, there is only selflessness. Selflessness is when you do something with all your heart or with your whole self. Then there is no artificial or superficial self in it. 
In selflessness, your real authentic self is revealed. Just as when a person is not trying to show it, somewhere it will reveal itself. You should love yourself. You should love life. This kind of love is necessary for you to forget yourself. It is only by actively putting yourself into the present moment that you forget yourself. When you do forget yourself, you act naturally, and your true self comes out. This true self is selflessness. This is the Buddhist teaching of forget yourself. <sighs> it's always interesting to me how the Dharma works in mysterious ways sometimes. So the time that uh, this is being broadcast, Thanksgiving is going to happen tomorrow, November 25th. And I wanted to give a talk that was somehow centered around both Buddhism and the holiday of Thanksgiving. And Reverend Guillaume did not disappoint providing me with an essay that perfectly encompasses both, both events and both teachings. But to understand how that works first, we have to first understand the teaching of emptiness, or shunyata, as it's expressed in Buddhism. And it's emptiness that, Buddha, that uh, Reverend Gyalme is discussing when he talks about forgetting oneself. It's emptiness that Dogen was trying to teach us about all those years ago. Emptiness is a central tenet, a central teaching of Buddhism. It's also one that's most often misunderstood. So I'm hoping this evening's Dharma talk will clarify some of those misunderstandings. The teaching of emptiness very simply states that our world is created via a stream of various types of consciousness or dharmas. And those dharmas are created by karma. Karma is cause and effect. A dharma is an aspect of truth or reality. And everything is the result of that karma and those streams of consciousness coming together to create other things. Thus, nothing has a separate, permanently abiding self. Everything is impermanent, here one moment, gone the next, and everything is an aggregate of other things. We can see this by looking at this Dharma book by Reverend Gyalme. Now, this book obviously, as wonderful as it is, is not permanent. It's unfortunate, but one day it will pass from this earth. Um, maybe there will be a fire and it will burn up. Maybe one of the cats will get a hold of it and rip it to shreds. Maybe it'll just disintegrate over a period of many years. So the book obviously is not permanent. At the same time, it is an aggregate of other things. So if we look at this cover, we can see it's made out of paper. Actually, it's made of like a cardboard material. It's a little shiny, so there's probably some clay in there to give it that shine. The pages are made out of paper. So right there, it's made out of cardboard and paper. And the pages are each made out of half ink, where the writing is coming from, and the ink has water in it. The paper itself is made from wood pulp. The wood pulp is made from trees that were made out of sunshine and soil and a forest. Countless streams of consciousness, countless karmic seeds being planted and ripening in order for this book to come into existence. It is an aggregate of things. So we can say that this book, just like everything else in our universe, is ontologically plural. Ontology means the study of self. Plural means more than one. It exists in more than one state of being at the same time. It is both being, it exists, I was just holding it in my hands, you saw it, and it does not exist. It's an aggregate of things. It has no permanent separately abiding self. It is one aspect, one dharma, 
of the universe that we all live in. This is true of Reverend Guillaume's book. It's true of me, my robes, you, everything. Thus, everything in our world is empty. This is the teaching of Shinyata, the teaching of emptiness. But these various streams of consciousness, like I said, they come from the ripening of karmic seeds. But how does karma work exactly? Well, karma is simply cause and effect. If I throw a baseball, that's a cause, and the effect is that it'll land somewhere. However, it's not just my karma in play, it's also the karma of the world around me. So the effect, the ripening of that karma, of me throwing the baseball, will change depending on where I am in the world and what's around me. If I'm out in the yard and I'm playing catch with a friend, the karma of me throwing the ball, that's the cause. The effect is that my friend will catch it and will have a nice game of catch. On the other hand, if I'm inside a house with large windows and I throw that same baseball with my same throwing arm, that's the cause, but the effect is that I will probably break a window. Same car cause, same karmic seed, but the ripening is different based on the karma of the world around me. Everything we do, every action we take, everything we wear, everything exists as an aggregate of other things. Existing in a state of being and non-being at the same time. This is the middle way that Buddha taught 2,600 years ago between eternalism, everything lasts forever, and nihilism, nothing exists, nothing is real. Emptiness is the middle way between these two extremes. Now that said, sometimes Dharma teachers, like Dogen, use extreme language to break us out of our old habits. So if we're very attached to our view of self, this idea that we are permanent, that we are separately abiding from the rest of the world, they may say things like, forget the self. There is no I. I'm thinking of a meme I see on Facebook sometimes where Robin is saying, hey, Batman, I just, and then Batman slaps him and says, there is no I. <laughs> Um, Buddhist humor, what can you say? Now, sometimes people take the teaching of emptiness to mean that nothing exists, that nothing is real, but that's incorrect. The teaching simply states that everything exists as part of something else. Me throwing the baseball is not separate from my friend catching the baseball. That's the teaching of emptiness. Me watering the houseplant isn't separate from the houseplant growing. That is the teaching of emptiness. It's not nothingness, quite the opposite. It's everythingness. This is why we say in Buddhism there is no self, but we still care about ethics. We say there is no self, but we still practice the Dharma. We say there is no self, but we still work for the benefit of all sentient beings. Because while it's true that there is no small self, there is no ego that is permanently, separately abiding from the rest of the universe, there is a larger self known as the Buddha body, also known as the Dharmakaya, also known as the storehouse consciousness that we are all a part of. When we say there is no self, we are saying that we are part of the larger self that everyone is part of. We're saying that we're not a tree that stands alone, whether we are a tree that is part of a larger forest. And thus our lives are interpenetrated with the lives of everyone around us.
Now, the reason we have suffering in the world is because we forget this interconnectedness, because we think there is a separate I. We lose track of the fact that our actions have consequences, that we are responsible to our other fellow sentient beings, and that our fellow sentient beings, in turn, affect our lives. As an example, I have chickens here on the homestead, six. And they're very healthy and they're running around, they're loving this cold weather. Chickens, this is an aside, but they have a very high internal body temperature, somewhere around 105 degrees. So they really don't like the summer months. It's really the spring, the winter, and the fall when they come into our into their own. And my chickens just started laying eggs, which is exciting. But we can't have healthy eggs without also having healthy chickens. So understanding this, I know that if I want eggs from my chickens, I need to care for them. I need to make sure they have fresh water. I need to make sure they have plenty of food. I need to make sure that they're protected from predators who want to eat them, like hawks and stray cats and raccoons. My understanding of the oneness between chickens and eggs results in me caring for my chickens. My understanding of the oneness between baseballs and broken windows results in me not throwing baseballs in the house. The chicken and the egg are one, the ball and the broken window are one. Emptiness ties everything together as opposed to ripping it apart. Now, the reason we make a mistake when we talk about emptiness in the West is because we have um, Judeo-Christian ideas about religion, about spirituality, and we try to superimpose them on Buddhist practice. So we think of this conventional world as being dirty and defiled, and we think of the absolute suchness as being some sort of heaven realm, right? So we need to get out of this conventional mode of thinking, and we have to go off somewhere pure, somewhere better. But that's not what Buddhism teaches. Buddhism teaches that this realm that we live in now is the absolute realm. And our practice isn't escaping to somewhere new, rather it's purifying our mind so that we can see this world for the Buddha body that it really is. Two people can look at the exact same picture. One sees a wonderful tree and a beautiful sunrise. The other person just sees patches of grass and dead plants. Who's right? Well, they're both right, because what changes is their mind, not the scenery. This is why I'm starting to prefer uh, Vasubandhu's teaching of the Three Natures Doctrine, as opposed to Nagarjuna's Two Truths Doctrine, when describing the world around us. They're both correct. However, Westerners, we tend to misunderstand Nagarjuna's teaching, which stated that our world exists in two satyas, or realities. We have the absolute reality, and we have the conventional reality. The absolute is the world of suchness, beyond name and form. The conventional world is our everyday life. And like I said, as someone who's taught the Two Truths Doctrine for many years, we always seem to think that the absolute world is, you know, that heaven realm outside of this world. And this is why we misinterpret emptiness, because we think if we just get rid of our sense of self, I'm not here, I don't exist, I have no emotions, no feelings, other people don't matter to me, then we'll find some sort of higher truth. And Reverend Yome, in his wisdom and compassion, is warning us against that sort of thinking. It's only when we connect the absolute and the conventional that we truly understand the teaching. That's where compassion comes from. That's where love comes from. When, that's when we're able to forget ourselves and our task. It's a dynamic practice. We see the oneness of the world and the small self, the ego, disappears. And there's only this, only suchness. 
Vasubandhu's teaching, uh, the Three Natures Doctrine, does a good job of explaining this because he has, uh, I'll call it, a middle path between the absolute and the conventional. So we have this conventional world of name and form, which we see every day. We have the storehouse consciousness, or the absolute, which is beyond name and form, which is suchness. And in between, we have the dependently originated nature. We have karma. And you can think about this as uh, two circles forming a Venn diagram. We have the absolute over here. We have the conventional over here, also known as the real and the imaginary and the absolute and the imaginary come together and where those circles intersect, if you ever looked at a, convention, at a Venn diagram, that's the dependently originated nature. That's karma. Again, we take the absolute, we take the conventional, we bring them together. That's where love comes from. That's where compassion comes from because we understand that this separate self is an illusion, but the larger self is very real. And we begin to see ourselves in the people around us. So what does all of this have to do with Thanksgiving? Well, the Thanksgiving holiday is a perfect opportunity for us to practice the selflessness that Reverend Guillaume tells us about. It's an opportunity for us to fully embody the teaching of emptiness. Because when we truly experience emptiness, we devote ourselves to others. We see this in the example of bodhisattvas, like Kanan, like Jizo, like Amida Buddha. These beings who have fully realized enlightenment, fully embody the teaching of emptiness, not by going off to some other world by themselves, but by working for the benefit of us and all sentient beings. And when we're working to prepare for Thanksgiving, when we're cooking food, when we're setting the table, when we're spending time with our family members, picking up grandma and grandpa so they can get a ride and see their grandchildren, we are embodying the selflessness, the emptiness that Reverend Guillaume is telling us about. The emptiness that Reverend Dogen was trying to help us achieve. It is in the holiday of Thanksgiving that the small self disappears and the big self, the Buddha body, the true self, reappears. And that Buddha body is seen, is embodied, no pun intended, by our family, whether that family is chosen or biological, the people we choose to devote ourselves to. The people we choose to spend time with, they are the Buddha. And by honoring and venerating them, we honor and venerate the Buddha who is on our altar, and vice versa. Because it's in this process of thanksgiving, of devotional practice, that we realize there is no separation. There's rather interpenetration. Our karma is one with their karma. Our body, though it appears separate, is one with their body. And we experience this firsthand when we share food with them. This is why food offerings are such a big part of Buddhist practice. It was traditional in the time of the Buddha for people to kneel before a monastic and offer them food in exchange for receiving a blessing. Now, we don't do that much here in the United States. However, we still give food offerings at our altars because it is food, amongst other things, that connect the Buddha body. When we feed others, we feed ourselves. When we eat with others and enjoy their company, we see the Buddha in them, and that thus helps us see the Buddha in ourselves because we are empty of existence. We are empty of the illusion of a separate self just for one day, just for that short period of time. So as we go out tomorrow on the highways and byways of America, however we spend Thanksgiving, whether it's with loved ones far and wide, or whether we simply have our 
close retinue of friends that will come to our house, or if we're just at home by ourselves. Understand that this practice, this holiday, isn't just about us. It isn't just about the food. It is a very powerful Buddhist training that will help us and the people around us realize enlightenment. Amitabha. So that's the talk for today. I hope it was helpful. We'll end with just a few announcements. So this was meditation and sutra study. It happens every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, broadcast from this channel. If you enjoyed tonight's practice, please make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you'll be notified when I post talks in the future. If you wouldn't mind hitting the like button again, that'd be great too. It'd be very helpful both to me and the channel. On Sundays, we do Dharma Sunday, which is a bit more or less involved, sorry. There I take some thing that's happened in the news or pop culture. I speak on it from a Buddhist perspective. So tying canonical Buddhist teachings with everyday life. I hope to see you there. Until next time, Amitabha.